Hello, I'm going to talk about intelligent architectures for intelligent computing systems. Uh, today's computing systems are bottleneck by data and data is really key for many workloads today and future. And data unfortunately overwhelms today's modern machines. It's a performance and energy bottleneck. And that's true for the workload that I show you, showed you earlier. That's true for workloads on the mobile end as well. That's true, for, especially for some emerging workloads where we're going to be extremely data intensive going into the future. Uh, for example, genomics is a special case where we can generate much more data than we can process today. As a result, the innovations in medical field and health fields are really bottlenecked by how fast and efficiently we can process the data with. As a result, data becomes an op op uh, a big a performance energy bottleneck for enabling innovation in workloads as well. And I'm happy to talk about this more, but in this very short talk, we don't have time, but we do a lot of work on genomics and its acceleration. And we see memory and data being a huge bottleneck. And I refer you to some of these papers that we have written more recently on accelerating genome analysis. So data today overwhelms the modern machines. It's their storage and memory capability, communication capability, as well as computation capability. So it greatly impacts robustness, energy, performance, and cost. And according to our studies that we did with Google, we found out that more than 60% of the total system energy in modern workloads on modern systems is spent only on data movement. So my axiom for the rest of this short talk is that an intelligent architecture has to handle data well. Of course, the question is how to handle data well. We need to ensure data does not overwhelm the components by intelligent algorithms, intelligent architectures, and intelligent whole system designs, all the way from algorithms to architectures and devices. We need to take advantage of vast amounts of data, data and metadata to improve architectural system level decisions. And we also need to understand and exploit properties of different data to improve the algorithms and architectures in many different metrics. So these are the corollaries in terms of how architectures today are dealing with data. I believe they're not dealing with data well. They're designed to mainly store and move data as opposed to compute. They're very processor centric as opposed to data centric. Data moves a lot in the system because it has to go through the processor and the accelerators to be processed as opposed to being processed in place. We're gonna talk a lot about this in the remaining part of the talk. Architectures today are terrible at taking advantage of vast amounts of data, data and metadata that's available to them. Uh, they're designed to make simple decisions, ignoring lots of data. They make human driven decisions. So for example, the cell phone I have makes a human driven decision in its memory controller for the past six years. It has not learned anything, even though it saw a lot of different conditions, a lot of different workloads, a lot of different users potentially, and it hasn't learned anything. So this is very different from humans. Humans make data driven decisions. They learn from the past behaviors, whereas computers don't in their controllers. And architectures today are not good at knowing and exploiting different properties of application data because in the underlying architecture in the system, the properties of data does not get communicated. For example, security critical data is not known, for example, privacy critical data is not known, uh, approximable data is not known, et cetera. Compressible data is not known. As a result, we make component aware decisions as opposed to data aware decisions in our controllers. So this talk is about how to handle data well. I believe future intelligent machines, if they need to be intelligent or if, they, if, we, if we want them to be intelligent, they have to be data-centric, data-driven, and data-aware. Now let me talk quickly about these properties very quickly since we don't have a lot of time. In my view, a data-centric architecture has to have four properties. First of all, we need to process where data resides. We need to have low latency and low energy access to data. We need to have low cost data storage and processing and we need to intelligently manage data. I'm gonna talk about especially the first aspect very quickly, processing data where it makes sense. Essentially, this is processing data where it resides. Processing in memory is a special case of it, but it's an important case. Basically, we would like to be able to query memory, ask question, can you execute this function? And the memory, if it is able to do so, returns results. There are many questions over here, of course. How do we design the memory and the controllers, processor chip and memory units, software and hardware interfaces, system software, compilers and language, and algorithms and theoretical foundations to enable all of this in the best way? So it's a across the stack problem all the way from algorithms and devices. But of course, we need to, to be able to solve it. We need to get there step by step. Another way of looking at it is, looking at memory as an accelerator, uh, that's a special accelerator than other accelerators that we have in the system. We know how to build many, many accelerators. And I believe memory is not that much different from uh, many accelerators. Uh, so we're gonna talk about that. But I think today, if you want to look at processing in memory, we want to look at it from a, uh, from a different perspective. And I think today there are two major opportunities for enabling processing in memory. One is minimally changing memory chips to do a lot of acceleration. Second, processing, I call this processing using memory. And the second is exploiting 3D stack memory or near data processing. 
So let's take a look at the first approach I'm going to spend most time on. This is minimally changing memory by exploiting the computation, the mock data movement capability of memory internally with small changes. You can exploit internal connectivity to move data. You can exploit analog computation capability. And who knows, maybe you can add some more capability to improve both of those. So uh, I, uh, we have developed many mechanisms to do in-memory block bitwise operations. We can support NDRM copying, initialization, uh, block bitwise and or not and majority operations at low cost using analog computation capability of DRAM. And the key idea is activating multiple rows performs computation and activating rows consecutively performs data copy. And this leads to significant performance energy improvements as depicted in this work, for example. I believe new memory technologies can enable even more opportunities because fundamentally they don't need to move data as much. You can operate on data in minimal movement. So I will very quickly gloss, uh, go over some of these papers uh, in slides, actually. You can see that there's a lot of work that has been done in this topic. But if you want to understand how this happens in the DRAM substrate, if you concurrently activate three rows based on chart sharing principles, you get a bitwise majority function. And bitwise majority function can give you an AND and OR function if you control the variable C over here. And if you want to get a NOT, uh, complement inverter operation, basically you feed the negated value in the sense amplifier into a special row with some additional circuitry. And this leads to significant energy and performance improvements for these bulk bitwise operations. And then of course, you can build anything essentially on top of this. You can change your algorithms to map any application to the substrate because the substrate is completely functionally complete. You have and, or, and not operations. And we have done that. There is, of course, some applications that benefit from bulk bitwise operations a lot, bit map indices, bit viewing, uh, bit funnel, like web search and database queries, et cetera. And according to our results, you get significant end-to-end -end performance improvements, as you can see, if you map queries to these uh, sub uh, substrate. And uh, actually, if, you, if the application is designed for the substrate, you can get even more e performance improvements, like 12x, as you can see over here. And I'd encourage you to look at these papers that I mentioned over here. And there's some more work coming up related to this. And there's also some other work that show that this could be done in real DRAM chips off the shelf and clearly in non-volatile memory chips as well. Now, very quickly, there's another aspect to this, which is exploiting 3D stacked memory. And there's an opportunity here. 3D stacked memory and logic already exists. And if we take advantage of it, we can actually get the great benefits and achieve a near data processing paradigm, have very high bandwidth and low latency access to large amounts of memory. And as a result, end-to-end -end application performance improvements can be extremely significant, as you can see over here. Uh, OK, but of course, uh, data-centric paradigms require some adoption. Uh, and this is not easy. And uh, here, I list the major uh, adoption issues in processing in memory, clearly. Uh, software is a big function of its system level and programming level functions, is a big function, runtime and compilation systems, compiler is important, uh, infrastructures to assess benefits and feasibility. I believe there are a lot of interesting issues which we document in the next work that I'm going to discuss, but all can be solved with a change of mindset, in my opinion. We can get there step by step, but we eventually we need to rethink the entire stack. And we recently wrote this paper that discusses a lot of these issues uh, and covers a lot of the works in processing in memory in a mod from a modern perspective. If you're interested, you can take a look at it. And this looks at a more workload and programming driven perspective. Now, there's a lot of hope, I believe, uh, I think, because there are a lot of interesting startups that are doing processing inside DRAM or inside uh, close to memory. And UP UpMem is one example of it. And we collaborate with them. And we look at, actually, the benefits of the UpMem engine. And we have a paper coming up at Sigmetrics that's describing that. So basically, I believe a big challenge and opportunity for the future is designing computing architectures with minimal data moments. Now, very quickly, I'll talk about the second and third direction as well. The second direction is how do you exploit data to design intelligent architectures so that architectures are not human driven anymore. We don't have simple short side fallacies all over the system. And we get to automatic data driven policy learning. So basically, today's architectures have almost no learning. We cannot, they cannot take lessons from past actions. The key question is, can we design fundamentally intelligent architectures? An intelligent architecture is data driven. Machine learns the best policies as opposed to human dictating them. We le this leads to sophisticated workload-driven changing far-sighted policies. And this leads to automatic data-driven policy learning. All controls in then need to be intelligent data-driven agents that coordinate with each other. Of course, the question is, how do we start? And I'm not going to give you the answer in this very short talk. I will point you to one of the works that we've done in this area. And more works are coming. This is self-optimizing memory controllers from ISCA 2008. But overall, I think we need to revisit the design of all controllers going into the future. The third direction is data-aware architectures. Basically, a data-aware architecture understands what it can do with and to each piece of data. It makes use of different properties of data to improve performance, efficiency, and other metrics, for example, compressibility, privacy, sparsity, locality, et cetera, access semantics, as I mentioned earlier, or criticality, for example. But today, unfortunately, we're not very expressive in terms of what we 
input to arch architectures. The architecture doesn't know a lot of the high level semantic information about data. And we would like to make that available to the underlying architecture by cutting through uh, the layers and making uh, the communication between the software and hardware high, uh, highly expressive. And if you're interested in, in terms of in knowing how we do this, you can take a look at these papers that I mentioned over here. Uh, and we have applied this methodology to various different works like DNN inference and uh, uh, bit, uh, sparse matrix operations, as well as virtual memory. And you can take a look at that. So this leads us to data aware architectures. I believe architectures for intelligent machines have to be have, or, or have to have these three properties: data centric, data driven, data aware. Maybe we can actually have intelligent architectures going into the future then. But we do need to re revisit the entire stack. But we can also get there step by step. So if you're interested, as I mentioned, this work details a lot of the data centric aspect, while touching on some of the other aspects as well. If you're interested, there's a longer version of this talk. Also, I know 10 minutes is not enough to cover a lot. But recently, I gave an IEDM tutorial that's more than two hours that covers a lot of the aspects that I described here in detail. And there are detailed lectures that we have delivered on processing in memory that you can also take a look at uh, in my computer architecture course, which is completely available on YouTube, as you can see over here. So I will acknowledge the funders of this work, as well as my current and past students and postdocs and collaborators, my group, essentially. If you're interested more, we have released some newsletters that you can take a look at over here. So thank you for your attention. I'd be happy to take any questions. And if you're really interested, you can take a look at the extended works uh, that I mentioned. Thank you.